hello 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 i'm so excited for this video oh my gosh hi if this is your first time on my channel hello it's nice to meet you um my name is emma and i'm here tonight starting off a video that is going to take a long time to make probably it's going to take me the whole month of january 2021 but this whole video this whole reading vlog that you just clicked on is of course devoted to childhood boyhood youth by leo tolstoy this is the first book that carolyn and i from carolyn mary reads she's down below as usual you guys should go check her out she's amazing we have started uh this year in 2021 in january you're not late to the party we've started a dickens versus tolstoy book club it's called the great debate and it is based off of a video called dickens versus tolstoy i'll leave it down below where actual professors and scholars debated but we've decided to read completely all of dickens and tolstoy's works and debate who is better so our pick for january we're starting with tolstoy childhood boyhood youth which is his first novel and ladies and gentlemen i have just started it on this night <laughs> it's tuesday and I was too excited to not come and talk to you about it, even though I'm already in my pajamas getting ready to go to bed soon. I just was too excited and I've only read the introduction. I haven't even yet got to Tolstoy's writing in this book, but I thought we could talk for a few minutes about it because like I said, very excited. In this reading vlog, you will find discussion about this book. There will be a lot of spoilers if you haven't read the book, um, although I'm not sure how many spoilers will actually be in here because it is mostly, you know, a very slow moving um, portrait of boyhood, childhood, and youth and the formation of a person growing up, what it's like to move through these three stages of being, psychological consequences, what it's like to live life in this time period in Russia and stuff like that. So you'll also find discussion a lot about this book, some analysis, some in-depth thoughts, and essentially debating this <laughs> versus Dickens, Charles Dickens, and seeing which one is better. So um, if that sounds like your cup of tea or coffee, then stick around. But um, the first thing I want to talk about is that I thought this was an autobiography of Tolstoy because it is called Childhood, Boyhood, Youth, and a lot of the writing is very, very autobiographical. Um, but the introduction assures you right off the bat that it is not a biography by any means of Tolstoy's life, although there are vague similarities between the life of Tolstoy and the life of our protagonist, whose name is, I believe, Nikolenka, if I'm putting the stress on the correct syllable. There are a few similarities, and of course Tolstoy does draw a lot on his own life, his own experiences, but it is by no means like a formal, legitimate, certified autobiography of any kind, of any sort. It is very much a fictional novel, being his first novel. So that's something that um, was dispelled immediately for me once I started reading the introduction, but it's okay because it assures you that something like this, something of this truth and like real, life, this real lifeness in the book must be autobiographical, that a first person account of such extraordinary particularity and rich interiority could only have come from direct personal recollection. Um, but alas, it did not. So that was interesting. The second thing I wanted to talk about very briefly before diving in, I'll probably start this either tonight or tomorrow, but they already compare um, near the end of the introduction, before we even get into Tolstoy's works, they compare childhood, boyhood, youth to Charles Dickens, specifically to his novel, David Copperfield, in that kind of growing up and following along of a character in that kind of coming of age story. So that was funny to see him mentioned there. And then he was actually mentioned a second time on the second page here of the introduction and they kind of um they kind of it's a slight <laughs> and it was really funny it made me laugh i think i am going to have my work cut out for me because if you do not know i will be defending uh dickens against this work of tolstoy's and in the end arguing not for tolstoy trying to pick out parts of this book that i don't think are well written that i don't think work well that for a reader aren't enjoyable or just trying to find the weakness that resides in childhood boyhood youth which i am beginning to doubt will not be very much but that's okay because um it's gonna be fun anyway but it was just so funny because they're talking about how Tolstoy is so magnificent at writing people, real people, and the uh, introduction says that one always has the sense, in this book, of encountering not so much conventional fictional projections, however striking or memorable, of concepts of human personality and situation, the sense that one may have reading Dickens, for example ouch <laughs> but in here as actual human beings whose complexity is never compromised for a thematic argument or 
rhetorical maneuver. So I just thought that was really funny. Um, this is going to be really hard to say anything bad about because I doubt I'll have anything bad to say, but yeah, so... Um, of course, this book begins with part one because it is a trilogy and it begins with chapter one of childhood, which is called Our Teacher. So that's all I've read. I've just read the introduction, but I just wanted to come on here, start this vlog. I'm really excited for where it's going to go, how it's going to turn out. I imagine it's going to be an extremely long vlog, so I'm going to sign off for tonight's start reading childhood either tonight or tomorrow, and I will let you know how it goes. So. Good morning guys, good morning. It is now January 2nd. Welcome back, I guess, to day two of this Tolstoy vlog. Um, childhood, boyhood, youth. Oh my gosh, I got past the introduction. I'm well into childhood, the first of the first movement, I guess, of this trilogy. Um, I'm 43, 42 pages through, and I have a lot to tell you about, a lot to talk about. I'm very excited about this. Where do I want to begin? If you'd like to annotate or find our annotation system that Carolyn and I are using for uh, this, I guess, book club and Dickens versus Tolstoy, The Great Debate, it's on our Instagram highlights, but briefly I will go over, I guess, the ones that I have. So we have pink for stuff that I'm loving, I'm enjoying. I'm not gonna lie about enjoying this book, even though I am currently trying to defend Dickens and as such not defend Tolstoy, but there's so much in here I'm loving. Uh, yellow is for quotes that I love and I want to, I guess, write down, keep, talk about. I have a couple of those. And then purple are things to debate. Um, so in terms of the first debate, I think I mentioned probably in one of my earlier just general reading vlogs, I'm going to try, we're both going to try not to be oppositional since this is the first book club pick and we haven't read any Dickens yet with you guys. So just the purple things I'm debating are things that I specifically think in childhood, boyhood, youth, Tolstoy hasn't done well or things that don't merit such celebration, things that wouldn't qualify him as a winner against another author and things like that. So I have a couple of those points that I'll talk about too. On the whole, I am loving it. I'm enjoying it. Of course I am. Um, how could I not? But let me get my coffee. But of course there are a couple things I want to discuss. So Let's see, starting in childhood. The chapters are quite short and choppy. In some cases, I absolutely love these because they're kind of like flashes of memory from our protagonist. In terms of the split of the chapters, I think sometimes it's definitely quite beneficial. I love looking at them, but then in other times, the jump between them seems a little bit choppy and strange. I'm not quite sure what to think of it all yet, so that's just something um, I have <laughs> that I'm mulling over. The first quote that I absolutely loved comes from chapter two, which is Memo, and it is just so beautiful. It says, so many memories of the past rise up when you try to resurrect in your imagination the features of a beloved being, that peering through those memories, you see the features dimly, as if through tears, the tears of imagination. Another thing I think is really nicely done in here is in this first movement, childhood, there's just so much that you get of Tolstoy really talentedly writing about childhood from the perspective of Nikolai because everything is everything is quite ballooned out and saturated and these little tiny moments take on immense importance and at times our narrator is so kind of disillusioned or he buys into these illusions of childhood that a child would really think, for example, when his father announces to him that him and his brother are going to be leaving for Moscow. He says to his dog, Milka, that we're leaving today. Goodbye. We'll never see each other again. I was overwhelmed and started to cry. Um, and there's just a lot of these really sweet moments that you get this serene sense of this childlike kind of dream quality where everything becomes exaggerated and any moment is bound to become momentous in the mind of a child because everything takes on so much more importance and magnitude and you can't always distinguish between what reality is as a child or what the reality of adults is because of course they're not gonna they're gonna see each other again they're gonna come back and there's another really really nice part 
like that when he's drawing or painting and he only has the color blue and he's painting blue dogs and blue boys and blue horses but then he says i was unsure whether you could paint a blue hair and ran to the study to consult papa about it so it's just stuff like that that like really takes on that kind of nostalgia and magic of childhood because it just seems very real to me. Okay, then we come to our first debate point that I just want to talk about for a second. Um, all these will go over in the live show, but if for some reason you guys don't want to watch the live show, if you can't watch the live show, if you just want to have like a nice reading vlog, I would like somewhere where my thoughts are all gathered kind of as a little preparation or whatnot. Um, the first thing that I would like to debate is something that, not the introduction, what is this? The end notes kind of bring up for me. What am I saying? They're, they're called something. The notes. Okay, they are just the end notes. I thought there was a fancy name for it. Um, it actually called it up for me first and made me notice it more, but there's been a lot more instances that I've had to point out as we go along in childhood where this, I guess, kind of narrative mistake comes up. I show a lot of Tolstoy being quite young, not yet mature, confident, not um, fully grown and developed as a writer because of course this is one of his first things ever, so it makes sense, but it is something that kind of breaks the flow, takes you out of the moment, takes you out of the book. The first one is when Nikolinka is in, I guess, the schoolroom with his brother and Karl Ivanich, who is his teacher, and Karl leaves the room to go and talk to a servant, um, and it says that their conversation could be heard from the classroom and then Nikolinka goes and listens at the door. And this whole book, of course, is set from this first person kind of looking back retrospectively at childhood, but it kind of breaks that wall and kind of lets you see Tolstoy behind the book writing it because as he's listening at the door, he says, sitting next to the window, repairing a boot, Nikolai, the servant, nodded affirmatively. And then a little later on, it says, the actions and what the two men are doing with their hands, what their faces are doing, um, how their bodies are sitting and all the stuff that of course someone just listening behind a door wouldn't be able to see or witness. And so it kind of breaks down this really strong depiction of reality and biography that Tolstoy has built up and kind of lets you see the machinery at work and see a little bit of mistake that is creeping into the narrative. I don't know, how does the back describe it? They probably do a better job than I do. Yeah, so it says he bursts, <laughs> it says he bursts a structural seam and Tolstoy shifts here and in the rest of the account of the conversation uh, moves from the limited first person mode generally employed in the trilogy whereby the narrator recounts only what he himself has witnessed or has been told to an omniscient mode. It says the logical lapse is brief and of little importance but it reminds us that for all the young authors extraordinary insight and skill his narrative technique at least in this early episode was not yet under perfect control. So that does happen a couple more times as well. Another scene is similarly when he's listening behind a door and his father is talking to Carl who um, he's trying to bring back and not let go and Carl finally convinces Nikolenko's father to allow him to accompany the children to Moscow but um it just again describes basically all the things that are going on behind the door what exactly was said when act in actual fact Nikolenko falls asleep <laughs> during this conversation but yeah it just kind of exhausts and takes a bit of that reality away and breaks down the scene and essentially the book and the, the fourth wall um when the narration breaks these established rules and habits that it's um, decided to write itself with and then I guess kind of the curtain is pulled back and you see Tolstoy there so um, it just clashes with the really talented the really talented portrayal of childhood and everything that he's got going on in here so that's just one thing just one thing because it is my job <laughs> it is my job at the moment to point it out so yeah Something I'm quite interested in seeing is how the transitions between childhood, boyhood, and youth go. If he remains as talented as ever, if we really see the growth and development of Nikolenka and how he grows up and things that change from one stage to another, I'm really interested to see that transition and that change. Um, I think it's going to be really good if I know Tolstoy, so yeah. This is another really nice part that just really like embodies everything that Tolstoy does so well. It's during the hunt when Nikolenka goes out with his household and they're hunting and there's a whole hunting party and they're going into the woods but it says the voices of people the clattering of horses and carts the merry chirping of quail the hum of insects hovering in motionless swarms the smell of wormwood straw and horse sweat the myriad colors and shadows the scorching sun cast upon the light yellow stubble 
The distant blue wood and pale lilac clouds and the white gossamer carried through the air or lying across the stubble. All that I saw, heard, and felt. Very nice. <laughs> Very nice. One point to Tolstoy. The last thing I think I want to share for right now is another quote that I absolutely loved. Um, and it just says, this is from chapter 11, and it says, Maman was playing the second concerto of her teacher, John Field. I dozed off, and light, luminous, limpid memories rose up in my imagination. Then she started to play Beethoven's Pathetique Sonata, and I recollected something sad, heavy, and gloomy. Maman played those two pieces often, and I remember very well the feeling they invoked in me. It was like a recollection, but a recollection of what? You seem to be recalling something that had never existed. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I love it. So that is my little update for right now. I think I'm going to go sit and tackle a few more pages of this, but I'm absolutely loving it. And <laughs> yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today is Monday, January the 11th. And um, I finished childhood a few days ago. I just sat down and read the first, I think, four pages of Boyhood. So I thought we'd have a little chat once I finished the first movement of this trilogy and just say how I'm feeling about it. I can also definitely give you a better idea of what it's about now that I know a lot of what this book holds. So basically just to give a bit of a rundown because I think I was pretty much only talking in quite broad terms before. Childhood Boyhood Youth follows our protagonist Nikolenka as he's living with his family. He has a brother, a sister, a mother, father, and a whole household of servants and people who work for his family because they're from a quite well-off um, class of society and so they're all living in this house in the countryside and it's just about him growing up. His personality is quite shy, timid, reserved, he's quite self-conscious, he perceives so much uh, just like intricate detail in life but then of course he's also quite cruel when he turns that inward on himself. I very much find myself like relating to him. He's very perceptive and very appreciative of beauty, arts, literature, his family. He has such tenderness in him for his mother especially and his father and his brother and he's quite perceptive of people and their traits. He's quite sensitive in that way but he's also so hard on himself, so self-conscious, so quick to point out the great things in other people, but also so quick to fault the minor inconsistencies in character within himself or to like really, really, I don't know, tangle out things in himself that he's not impressed with or happy with about himself. And it's quite hard actually seeing him go through all of this really um, uh, self-criticism because it's really not warranted. He's really actually a really nice person I'm getting so far. That's kind of what I'm getting from him. And he's quite, giving and caring although of course there are parts where he is blinded by his status his wealthy status his family's status and looking back on it retrospectively because that's kind of how Tolstoy writes this book it's really interesting to see the parts of his childhood that he's critiquing um, and it's just really nice in that way so that's kind of what this is about you follow them as him his brother and his father go to Moscow and they're staying at his grandmother's house. There's balls. We've chronicled like his first love. Um, there's a bit of a love that I'm not really sure. I need to like do a lot more research on Tolstoy and sexuality, but there is a scene where basically it's a few chapters back to back and we kind of have his first love, but he's also talking about so much admiration and so much feeling he has for um, a boy, one of his friends who comes and stays at his grandmother's house for a while, Sir Ser Serios. 
Seriosa, if I'm saying that right. And then um, Seriosa is quite volatile, aggressive, angry, uh, and is very much a bully. And eventually, thankfully, we kind of get that turnaround as Nikolinka discovers this. And then he sets his sight on another guest that comes for a ball at his grandmother's house, a young girl. And they start to develop a relationship, even though, of course, it is all just like childhood infatuation and just kind of that first glimmer of feeling you get towards another person in that respect. So that was just really sweet and wholesome to read. And that's kind of what you follow in childhood are his impressions. And of course, our narrator, Nikolenka, retrospectively looking back on his childhood, you get brilliant writing, really nice lines extraordinary insight and clarity of like nature feelings perceptions other people um household and family matters and it's just really quite charming quaint charming and it makes you want to sit down with a cup of tea is how i would describe the first movement so i'm now moving into boyhood and i'm really excited to see what the second movement holds we have a lot of pink because pink is stuff that i'm loving all the purple points are things that i want to debate um, and kind of weaknesses and things I've tried to tease out that maybe Tolstoy didn't really super excel at in writing in this novel. Green is for imagery in really nice places, um, talking about things, describing things. Yellow is for amazing, wonderful quotes. Blue is for sad. That's another thing. This book is getting quite sad. Um, at the end of childhood, there is quite the tragedy, and I am going to go into it because, like I said, this vlog is not going to... Um, shy away from spoilers at all there's gonna be quite a lot of spoilers so i'll just give you another warning but i almost cried it was actually really really sad and just the way that tolstoy wrote it um and the way that he kind of revealed how this tragedy happened was so nice so i guess maybe we'll start there because that's one of the things i wanted to talk about yeah so let's start with the tragedy i guess that finishes off childhood and what nikolenka says marks his transition into boyhood is this tragedy that's really marked him being the death of his mother so like i was saying half of the family is staying in moscow and um his mother his sister and the rest of the household is still in the countryside at their estate but they get a letter when they're staying in moscow from his mother and it's just so devastating particularly in the way that like they do it because if you can see they have like the main letter that his mother writes it's quite lengthy saying how great things are going what the countryside is looking like and it's all written in russian and then you turn the page and it's like this little addendum there's like another little mini letter tucked into the first and it's just so brilliant especially the way it was arranged because this whole letter is written in french so that a lot of the maids and whoever was sending the letter off couldn't read it or couldn't get inside it to see what his mother was saying but then in this letter it literally began don't believe what I wrote about my illness. No one suspects how serious it is. I know only that I'll never leave my bed. It's definitely quite the big surprise to like just go from reading this really sunny, nice, bright letter with not very much of consequence and you're not really sure stepping into this whole novel at all how much of an impact or how serious um, of a turn things are gonna take so then when you literally turn the page and you just get this really devastating almost letter of farewell from a mother to her family to her children and husband it just was like a punch in the face and then we get this like really huge beautiful quote from her saying will my love for you and the children end with my life i realized that that is impossible I feel too strongly at this moment to think that the feeling without which I cannot comprehend existence could ever be destroyed. My soul can't exist without my love for all of you, and I know that it will last forever, if only because a feeling like my love could not have come into being if sometime it had to end. Like, oh my gosh. Just like, I, like, it just feels like such a real letter that could have been written and obviously Tolstoy is just so great at writing because it just like hit me so hard and it was just so sad and then from there of course we get Nikolinka and Volodya and his family scrambling home from Moscow to try and like reach their mother before she dies and they don't end up even getting to say goodbye because by the time they get back home she's unconscious and it was just so sad and it but so brilliant because the way that like Tolstoy displays and shows grief um when they arrive home as like this journey through 
the house they like have to go through so many doors and hallways and time seems to almost slow down because you think that it really shouldn't be taking this long you should be able to run through these doors and these corridors or whatever but you really get like this sense of time being so mushy um, and hard to get through just as kind of Nikolinka is like trying his hardest to race against time and scramble through these doors and huge long corridors but he doesn't end up making it on time and it's just so hard to read and then the whole way that Tolstoy writes grief and of course everyone in the family is going through it in a different way it's just so intricate and nicely done so like that was something I really enjoyed I kind of want my glasses where did I put them okay so I just said a really really great point but you guys know my job for this first read is to tease out parts where I think um it's not so great so I do have one and <sighs> obviously we get everything through um, this first person, Nikolenka, throughout the three movements. And in childhood, there is a lot of like very intuitive and believable perception on Nikolenka's part, especially because, like I said, Tolstoy is writing this retrospectively through the guise of his protagonist. So like that's believable. But there are parts, there are parts though when number one on that point, it's hard to distinguish whether Nikolinka knows this piece of information that he's imparting to us, the reader, then, or whether he's come to retrospectively learn it now that he's older and is writing this piece of childhood. So like that's kind of the first part and that is a little bit confusing and like kind of takes you out of it and makes you take a step back for a little bit because you're thinking, well, like how does he really know this piece of information? Is it really indicative of what he was feeling at that moment if he's only come to learn it retrospectively to then insert it back into the past to color his past self when he's writing to us like at the present in his childhood so that's kind of a whole issue but then the second piece is that there is a lot in here that even Nikolinka no matter what age she is it's just not believable to me that he would know this piece of information and this piece of insight about a certain character I'm mostly talking about the information pertaining to knowing something about a different person's character a secondary person for example the one I really kind of honed in on and highlighted is when Nikolinka um, is talking about a prince that comes to visit Prince Ivan. We get a lot about his background and there's a lot of like emotional information that's given about him. We learn that uh, he wasn't a man of great intelligence, but thanks to his position, which permitted him to regard the petty aggravations of life from above, his mode of thought was a lofty one. He was kind and sensitive, yet cold and even aloof in his manner of address. So like that is a lot of perception for an 11 year old child to have but i can believe that like nikolinka is quite sensitive and very drawn to emotions and like the perceptions of others and kind of being able to read a room so like that's all well and good but then we get stuff like still talking about the prince he had read everything remarkable written in france in the 18th century in the areas of philosophy and rhetoric and had a sound knowledge of all the best works of french literature so that he could often and so that he could and often did cite passages from da -da 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 -da, a whole bunch of people um he had a brilliant knowledge of mythology and had with profit studied in french translation the ancient monuments of epic poetry and he had an adequate knowledge of history gleaned from da -da -da, like listing all of these historians that we know or that Tolstoy is saying that Nikolinka knows the prince has read so like that's just not very believable to me um because these seem like character traits and knowledge that could only be gained from like an omniscient character and in this case that omniscient character would be Tolstoy himself so like a lot of my main complaints have just been that Tolstoy in this first work isn't very adept yet and is completely understandable and not letting us see him and not letting us see the crafter behind the craftsmanship and honestly that's kind of a small complaint to have but like that's really what I'm working with because it's brilliant otherwise but for me like that does take a little bit of the believability the validity and the honesty out of it and this depiction of true life because how on earth could our first person Nikolinka know exactly what text and like how this prince has studied what Ivan has read without him like 
making his acquaintance and having Ivan tell him all of this information because he only meets Ivan once for a few minutes and then he's gone. So I just don't know how he would know all of this. Um, so it does take a bit of that kind of reality out of the situation for me at least so that was kind of one of the points i wanted to critique in childhood uh i kind of have already talked about it a little bit but that was another area where i felt like tolstoy was just really peeking through so something i really do have to praise is that the way that tolstoy writes a person he really takes into account almost every single time like the language that a person uses and obviously not just what language a person speaks but how they use that language to express themselves and how using language um, as description and as a way for the reader to get to know a person a character in a book it's just so nice because there's just so many mentions of it. We do have a variety of different languages in childhood, boyhood, youth. Obviously there's Russian, there's French. We even get a little bit of church Slavonic when a wandering uh, worshiper of God comes to stay at their house in the countryside. He speaks in church Slavonic when he's uttering his prayers. So you just really get like such a characterization through language and particularly even with Russian, Tolstoy's description of how people use Russian. I wish I could speak Russian and then I could kind of know even more of what he's talking about but when he's talking about Nikolinka's grandma um, he says that grandmother had a special knack for using the second person singular and plural pronouns with a certain tone of voice in certain situate in certain situations to express her view of people her use of thou and you inverted the generally accepted practice with their nuances acquiring a completely different meaning on her lips um, so it's just so nice to see that like formation and making a person because even the introduction I think talked a little bit about it. It would be incorrect to say that Tolstoy would have agreed with a contemporary that language may determine thought, but it is certainly true that he not only accepted but applied in a fairly elaborate way in the trilogy the idea that language embodies and instills a powerful multi-layered cultural orientation and impetus and even to some degree an ideology. So I just thought that was really nice. Um, so yeah, that's kind of all I have to say of that right now like i said i am now 125 pages through i just read the first chapter of boyhood so i'm gonna go read a bit more and then i imagine i will update you guys in a few days so thanks for coming out <laughs> Good day. Hi guys. So I have not sat down to update you in a while on childhood, boyhood, youth, but I am here. I just made myself a very big cup of tea. So I thought we could sit down and get really cozy. This is going to be an extremely long chat. I'm feeling so chatty. I want to go so in depth on this book because I'm almost done. I've almost finished it and i'm on page 368 i have about i think 20 no 30 a little less than 30 pages left i'm so excited to finish it um for this little chat i'm just going to be pretty much going over a lot of things that i've remarked that i found there's been some really nice imagery some beautiful quotes there's also been quite a few points that i have to debate quite a few points that i'm not loving in this book it is currently blizzarding outside so much today is january 27th 28th it's one of those 27th or 28th but it's literally blizzarding so much it's like humming into the balcony but let us 
talk, let us have one of our last talks about childhood, boyhood, youth, at least in this vlog. So I don't recall if I've talked too much about boyhood, but boyhood begins once again with Nikolinka and his family going from the countryside to Moscow. As they're going off, the trip is quite nice. It's a sunny day. There's lots of nice things to remark and look about. And then quite suddenly, almost immediately, a thunderstorm crops up and starts to blacken and darken the sky and these clouds roll in. Everyone gets quite nervous at this change in atmosphere, this change in pressure. The sunlight is like half covered up by these clouds and there's like this really nice just whole like three or four pages of description of this thunderstorm that's taking over their journey and honestly that's kind of the same thing that happens to our little protagonist in here Nikolenka as he voyages from childhood which for him was quite a serene tender time that he remembers so fondly and as he moves into boyhood and youth you really get the sense that he regrets a lot of what happened during those formative years of his life. He regrets his decisions and the way that he treated people and the way that he formatted his own brain and the way that it was, I guess his thoughts and his feelings and his perceptions were influenced so heavily both by his class and the people around him. And he really regrets this tumultuous time that he's going through growing up. Um, and you really get a sense of that as you see Tolstoy kind of not agreeing anymore with his uh, past self, or I guess Nikolinka not agreeing anymore with his past self and the views that he held. So that's kind of what we're getting going into boyhood and youth, just to set the tone a little bit. And it does start off with a thunderstorm, so you kind of see that there's going to be some trouble, some dissonance, and uh, yeah, some shadows, some light and shadows. One of the first scenes that we get with Nikolinka kind of realizing his privilege and his class and his wealth is on this road. The thunderstorm has just cleared, they've almost arrived in Moscow and he's talking to his childhood friend Katenka who's not of the same social standing not of the same wealth as he is and Katenka tells him that you're rich and we are poor and Nikolenka reflects that those words and the ideas connected with them seemed quite strange to me according to my notion at the time only beggars and peasants could be poor and there was no way my imagination could combine that idea of poverty with the graceful, pretty Katenka. I clearly realized for the first time that we, that is our family, weren't the only ones in the world, that not all interests revolved around us, that another life existed of people who had nothing in common with us, who didn't care about us, and who had no idea we even existed. You get a hint, I think, on the road to Moscow that a lot of boyhood and youth is going to be centered around Nikolenka's ideas that he's starting to form with regards to the influence that has been wrought upon him by his social standing, by his well-off family, by the class and sort of people around him that is very wealthy and well-to-do and prominent social people who do what is expected of them and he starts to develop this notion that gets so expansive especially near the end of youth of come eat full the french phrase basically meaning people who do as they should or who do by a certain code and who follow a certain way of thinking and philosophy and are always come eat full as they should be um they speak french well they are very well educated they cut their nails, they like do all of the very rich, well-to-do, well-off kind of thing. And so that's basically his whole basis for judgment of everyone he sees and starts to interact with. Um, and he just gets these really poisonous ideas uh, instilled in him by the type of people that he's surrounded by. So you really, it's just so sad to see him move from childhood, from this time that he adores so much to boyhood and youth, where he retains so much of that shyness and social anxiety that we saw in him in childhood. He doesn't relinquish it. In fact, he holds it tighter and tighter. And that anxiety and that shyness and that inability to branch out, to emerge from his cocoon of thoughts and his individuality combined with these ideas of class and the kind of people that he's around, it just really doesn't go well for him. It, it's not a fun thing to read about seeing him go from this little shy boy to a very ignorant, close-minded adult who's afraid to speak his mind and the ideas that he does have in his mind are quite harmful. Um, boyhood is the shortest movement and a lot of it you just kind of see him throwing temper tantrums. He's not a good person by any means in boyhood and of course the age I believe he's around 11 in boyhood he is extremely jealous he's prone to Im immense mood swings he's going through a lot as 11 year olds 
do and you just see him act out of course he's just witnessed the death of his mother and it's affected him and he feels alone and sad and he feels like no one loves him there's this whole scene where he's closed up in a closet because he's being punished for literally attacking his tutor whom he hates so much um but basically that is all boyhood is is just him acting out and not being very nice to anyone around him including himself one of the last things i want to talk about in boyhood is that he starts to get wrapped up in philosophy he starts to become obsessed with philosophy and different ideas and he cites it as one of the more disastrous parts of his character development that he's become so embroiled in these philosophical ideas and debates with himself during the year in which I led a solitary mental life, concentrated on itself alone, all the abstract questions about human purpose, the future life, and immortality of the soul had already presented themselves to me, and my feeble child's intellect tried with all the ardor of inexperience to make sense of those questions, the posing of which is the highest rung the human intellect can reach, even if the answers aren't given to it. There's a really beautiful part that comes out of this that I just adore so much when he is just alone in his room thinking to himself, reading about these philosophical ideas, and he says, Here's life, and I drew an oval on the blackboard. After life, the soul enters eternity. Here's eternity. And I made a line extending from the oval all the way to the edge of the blackboard. But why isn't there another line on the other side? And indeed, what sort of eternity could there be on only one side? We probably existed before this life, although we've lost all memory of it. I just thought that was really beautiful. I really like that. One of the ideas of philosophy that Nikolinka becomes obsessed with and you really see like come back to bite him as he develops into youth is skepticism. Uh, and he says that I imagined that except for me, no one and nothing else existed in the whole world, that things weren't things, but images that existed only when I directed my attention to them, and that as soon as I stopped thinking about them, those images would instantly vanish. It isn't things that exist, but my relation to them. So yeah, that's something that's definitely gonna come back because I feel like that skepticism, him being so drawn to that branch and that brand of philosophy is so in line with the way that he's been brought up to believe that he holds so much more value because of his place in society, because he's rich, because he's well off, because he has all of these noble relations and does the things that are meant to be done by his class of family and the people he's surrounded with um but he just becomes like a balloon he becomes so self-inflated that near the end of this book i really wanted to throw it out the window so many times because it's just so grating on your nerves to read about this extremely superior being who thinks he's the best who thinks that he is the smartest and who looks down with so much condescension on absolutely every single person that he's with that he's talking to he looks down on everyone and he starts to have these daydreams of course we knew that he had these like kind of sweet serene almost naturalistic daydreams and like pastoral images passing by in his childhood but now they're mostly about himself and he's turning inward and he says that i frequently imagine myself a great man disclosing new truths for the benefit of all humanity and looked on other mortals with a proud awareness of my own merit so that's pretty much him throughout all of boyhood and all of youth. I know Tolstoy is definitely showing kind of the dangers of this puffed up existence that privilege can build up for people, but it's just so <laughs> um, not fun for me to read. It's not a fun experience at all. It's one that I felt myself wanting to rush through the scenes where Nikolenka is just talking about himself. We see that he has absolutely like no concept of how to talk to people beneath his station or below him in class and rank. And he's just so concerned with being the greatest person in the room at all times, um, which I guess Tolstoy does think happens in adolescence, which I'm not exactly sure if that's a universal adolescent emotion, but of course, as you do grow up and you're going through your teenage years or your boyhood or youth or whatever it may be, that period in life, you do get a sense of your own self as now being separate from that of your family and you get this heightened kind of outline of your own body, of your own physical being and your own mental being of who you are as a person. I'm sorry, Nori. And you just see Nikolinka like really taking this the wrong way and to an extreme. 
Something else that I feel like is a good place to touch on because it's in chapter 21 of Boyhood and it's basically a thing that's been going on for the whole novel. The description, introduction, characterization, and presentation of women <laughs> in childhood, boyhood, youth is definitely very disappointing. Pretty much every single person that is introduced in this novel, when they are first introduced, they get paragraphs and paragraphs describing their appearance, describing what they're like, their background, their family, their history, and a list of basically all sorts of things that make up who they are. Tolstoy is very talented at creating these individual characters with these individual traits, very specific, very human. What he's not good at is introducing men and women in the same vein, equally giving them fleshed out merits of both appearance, of outward looking, of their material being, and then giving them an equal footing on who they are as a person, the substance that fills them up, that untouchable essence that creates a person. He's really good at doing it with men. We see this with so many descriptions of people that he introduces. He tells us exactly what their character is like, what they aspire to be, how they aspired to be where they are via their past. But with women, when he introduces them more often than not, not only do they get a much smaller section of introduction, and background, but almost 95% of it is all their appearance, which is really disappointing. And so they just become much more flat caricatures and much less filled out people. They become less like people and more like dolls, essentially, I would argue, in this book. A really good example in Boyhood is chapter 21 called Katenka and Lyubochka. Lyubochka is Nikolenka's sister and Katenka is their childhood friend, who's also, they're both girls, Katenka and Lyubochka. So he's talking about how Katenka has just turned 16, she's growing up, and then he places Katenka and Lyubochka side by side, and not only is the content of um this chapter just uh, meh, Tolstoy. Nikolenka is looking at both girls and comparing them to each other and essentially outlining in Katenka all the merits of what the ideal woman should be and in his sister Lyubochka all of the bad things that a girl should not be because she does not follow the code of being a woman in this time period. Lyubochka is short, she still has bandy legs and a terrible waist. The only good thing about her appearance is her eyes. Lyaboshka's gaze is always direct, and sometimes when she fixes her enormous dark eyes on someone, she doesn't remove them for such a long time that people rebuke her for it. Katenka, on the contrary, drops her eyelashes, squints, and claims to be short-sighted. Lyaboshka is an awful giggler. Katenka, on the contrary, covers her mouth with her handkerchief or her hands whenever she starts to laugh. Lyabochka is endlessly indignant with Mimi for lacing her up in corsets until she can't breathe and she likes to eat. Katenka, by sticking her finger under the scalloping below her bodice, often shows us how loose it is for her and eats extraordinarily little. According to my opinion, Katenka seems much more grown up and is thus much more to my liking. So even though we got basically devoted to these two girls a whole chapter, which is like a, almost two pages, very little of it is actually about who they are and their character and more about how they adhere to the strict codes at the time. Um, once again, I'm not too sure like how transparent Tolstoy himself is on these two pages, like how much he's actually in here and versus how much is just Nikolinka and Tolstoy's writing at the time. But like, I do think it is a common theme throughout this whole novel that the women introduced, especially when we get to youth. I've marked a lot more um, examples that I'll give during the debate and stuff like that if you'd like to see, but literally a man will be introduced and he'll get so much about who he is. And then Tolstoy will introduce a woman or a young girl or someone, um, and it will just be like the description of her hair and eyes and body. Um, it's just especially apparent because I just turned a few chapters and on chapter 25, we have a chapter called Velodia's Friends, which is Nikolinka's brother. And then Tolstoy goes on to describe the two friends. For example, in this, he talks about the boys' uh, philosophies, their judgments, um, their family, if they're come ifo, which I guess ties in a little bit to that, their friendship, the way in which they are related to one another in terms of friendship, how their friendship looks um, in respect to like Velodia's relationship with the two of them. 
um, the way that they joke, their relationship to their family. Yeah, so there's just a really, really stark difference and it's really noticeable. Okay, and then we get to youth. So let's talk about youth. So youth begins when Nikolinka is almost 16 and he defines the start of youth as the time when Dimitri, the friend, Volodya's friend who I mentioned, basically introduces him to this idea that moral improvement of humanity is what should be like the center of your attention and what you should be directing um, your energy at. On pretty much the second, I think the second chapter of youth, we see this idea of philosophy that he developed in boyhood take on a really comical but also still disastrous angle. Nikolenka becomes so concerned with like the idea of doing good and not doing good and being a good person for the intrinsic moral value of just doing good because it's good but he wants to do good in order to be labeled as a good person as good he starts to do these things for people in his life like his tutor saint jerome and stuff like that and he says that i was trying to give my voice the mildest expression when he says let me help you um and made my mood even milder by the thought that in suppressing my vexation to help him i was doing good I think that if the storage closet had been a mile away and the frame twice as heavy, I would have been even more pleased. I wanted to wear myself out doing that service. So he has these like really literal and very strange kind of building blocks that he's built up into these ideas of doing good for people, but it's just so skewed because he wants to do good simply to have this like moral philosophy, this code that he's following because he really has nothing else in his life. He's going to university, he's in the same social circles, but now he's obsessed with this philosophy of doing good. Childhood Boyhood Youth is also an extremely nostalgic book where Nikolinka, he's writing all three movements of the trilogy of Childhood Boyhood Youth retrospectively. He's looking back on them. He gives us a little bit of his opinion on what he thinks of himself, what he thinks of his actions, and we can kind of see that in the way that he's talking about certain things that he did, or sometimes he will break down and at the end of a chapter he will revert back to his present self, which is of course after all three movements have happened and he's writing it and he'll tell us literally and very directly to the audience audience what he thinks of what he's done. Um, Tolstoy writing Nikolenka, writing past Nikolenka. Something I found really interesting is that at the end of childhood and in a few places in childhood, he's bemoaning that it's past and that it's over and that it's done and he wishes he could go back to it because for him it was such a wonderful time in his life. It was very pure very wholesome. He had his family in the country, his mother was alive, he was forming these really nice ideas of who he was and just having a good time. Um, for example, in chapter 15 of Childhood, he says, Will the freshness, unconcern, need for love, and strength of faith you possess as a child ever return? What time could have been better than when the two finest virtues, innocent gaiety and a limitless need for love, were life's only impulses? Has life really left such a heavy mark on my heart that those tears and raptures are gone forever? Are the memories really all that remain? So he's really pining for childhood. And by the time you get to youth, the Nikolinka in youth, not the retrospective Nikolinka writing the memories, but him in youth at the time that he's almost 16, um, he says now that it seemed so easy and natural to me to break free of everything in the past, make a fresh start, forget all that had gone before and begin my life and all its relations anew that the past didn't bind or oppress me. I even took pleasure in my disgust and tried to see the past as gloomier than it was. The blacker the circle of memories from the past, the more purely and radiantly that the bright point of the present stand apart from it and the rainbow colors of the future unfurl. And then a few sentences later, how often in melancholy times when my soul was quietly submitting to life's falsehood and depravity has that virtuous consoling voice suddenly and boldly risen up against every untruth, fiercely unmasking the past, indicating the clear point of the present, making me love it and promising goodness and happiness in the future. Can it really be a virtuous, consoling voice that one day you will be heard no more? Okay, there's a lot to unpack in there. So we see in childhood, like the first part I read, that Nikolinka writing it is very obsessed. He loves his childhood. He wants to get back to it. He has fond memories of it. A lot of people do. We miss those childhood days, the simplistic, easy um, exuberance and everything that comes with childhood. But then when we get to youth, we kind of see him 
talking about the past in a way that not only might not be true, and you could argue that Nikolink is trying to convince himself that where he is at the present moment is much better, but when you read childhood, he has it pretty good. Nikolinka has it really good for all this book. He's a well-off, well-educated young man. And then we see him complaining about his past, calling it gloomy, um, saying it oppressed him, saying that it's a black circle of memories. And that when he thinks of this, it unmasks the past and reveals to him the present and makes him love where he is and disparage what has come before. I think it's a very complicated tangle of human emotions, but I also think there's a little bit of contradictory nature in there because he's respectively nostalgic for both childhood and youth because by the time you get to the end of that passage in youth, we have Nikolinka when he's done writing and we see that he's nostalgic both for childhood and for youth, a time period when he's under 10 years old and then he's 16 again, but in youth, he completely disparages the past and says it's it's no good, it's bad, it was a bad time, and saying that it's bad makes him love where he is in youth. So it just seems like both of those things, like it's not a logical nostalgia for me. I think there's a little bit of a disconnect there. I think it's a really nitpick thing, but it was just something that I noticed and I was like, these two ideologies don't really line up. This nostalgia for both youth and childhood and youth when in youth, you are saying childhood is not very good anymore. Um, and even if you can say that and you're just saying that Nikolinka from youth is disparaging childhood to make him love his time when he's 16 in youth, I still don't think that lines up because Tolstoy, who is writing the book, taking on the air of Nikolinka when he's a grown-up man and all of this is behind him, childhood and youth is behind him, that Tolstoy that writer, Nikolinka, under the guise of Tolstoy as the writer, is saying that he is nostalgic for both of these times. It just seems like maybe there's a disconnect where he doesn't realize that he's pretty much blocked off childhood in youth by saying that he's nostalgic for youth, which blocks off the nostalgia for childhood. <laughs> I don't think any of that just made sense. I'm so sorry that I did not explain that well at all. So in this nostalgia, obviously we get kind of a fear of growing old and a fear of old age and death. And when he says, can it really be over to his voice that one day you will be heard no more? Will there ever be a point? He's saying when there will be no more past to unmask that will make you love the future. That will make you love the present and be excited for the future, which is a really sad thought. Um, but that was just something that I noticed as well. And then I think one of the few last things I just want to say, because this clip's probably gotten pretty long, Nikolinka and Youth is so hard to read. There's just so many parts where he's interacting with people and he's like, oh, this man just met the greatest young person ever me or guess who's the greatest it's me or once again i'm off having a daydream or a fantasy that i'm doing all these great things and providing benefits for humanity or he starts to judge people and the kind of person someone is literally by their posture um and it just gets like really ridiculous and like i understand that it's just as a reader it is not an enjoyable experience anymore especially when so much imagery and so much of the beauty of tolstoy's writing in childhood kind of gets sucked out a little bit and thrown out the window and in youth you really just have him describing in more of the blunt language he uses when he's in places like Moscow or doing um, things in the city and in the social setting, you really get like a blunt narrative of everything that he's doing on a day-to-day -day basis, which isn't as exciting anymore when it's not splotched in with those really beautiful lyrical lines that Tolstoy is so good at creating, especially because Nikolinka is such a little brat. He's a little brat. When you have lines with him saying like, I was vexed that he had put me in such a false position with his son and that he was keeping me from attending to what at the moment was a very important activity for me, getting dressed. It's just, it's a little bit too much to take. Um, speaking of imagery, I think you do get a few little, little places of it. One of my favorite ones is on page 290. There's been a lot of imagery. Obviously, Boyhood started off with the sky being half of it clouded over by a thunderstorm. And then later on, you do get these flashes of imagery that is half and half. Um, 
so for example we see in this scene where they're in nature with these he's with his friend dimitri and dimitri's family and they're going out to look at some stuff the sun was already low on our right above the old trees of the orchard and half its brilliant red disc was covered by a gray weakly translucent storm cloud while from the other half fragmented rays burst forth in fiery sprays to illuminate with startling brightness the orchard's old trees, their dense green crowns motionless against the clear, luminous azure of the sky. The brilliance of the light in that part of the sky was in stark contrast to the dark purple cloud spread before us over a young birch grove on the horizon. So, yeah, I just really love this like half and half imagery that Tolstoy gives us in nature like kind of that there's a barrier or a line or a border um, between these two halves and one might be childhood boyhood youth this adolescence this growing up and the barrier is into adult life into adulthood into growing old into being a grown-up and eventually into dying and it's super hard to cross that border to even see where it is where it lines up how how to get over there at what point how do you know um and it's just so beautiful that he does it in nature because i think even with that imagery and the way that he's providing it he's giving you a hint of the answer and that it's it's something natural you're never going to know when it happens and in nature these borders don't really exist when a storm cloud passes over half of the sun and the other half still casts this light um, not only is it super reminiscent of that famous quote in Anna Karenina that says, all of life is made up of light and shadow. I don't think I said that completely correctly, but it's definitely, I think, a precursor to Tolstoy writing that quote. But when you have these two halves, like nature doesn't distinguish them. Nature just lets itself be, the sun lets itself be half covered and half illuminated. The clouds cover half of the sun. And the rain might stop here and start here. And it really, it doesn't matter. And Nikolinka and a lot of young people, I think pretty much everyone, all of us, we're so concerned with when do we meet a certain criteria? When do we cross into a new place in our lives, a new formation? How do we know we're there? When are we gonna get there? When are we gonna be happy? When are we gonna be grown up? What is the future gonna look like? And the simple answer is that you can literally never know. And I think just accepting it naturally as it comes when Nikolinka gets to go outside with his friends and these people that he's met and see these scenes, nature is providing him with that answer the way that Tolstoy is writing is providing us with that answer, but Nikolenka doesn't see it. He doesn't appreciate the natural half and half split. He doesn't appreciate that what he's seeing as a boundary and something half covered and half unveiled doesn't actually exist. It's just kind of a convention that's been built up. And obviously these are extremely detrimental ideas when trying to force someone to have a certain way of thinking or to behave a certain way when they are a certain age or saying that at this age you should now have this education and these moral values and you should talk like this and then at this age you should get married or you should be having children at this age or when you're very young you can't know things you you can't be that smart you are not taken seriously and i think it's just a really really nice exploration and something i just absolutely have to praise because it's so well done and <laughs> to boot it's so beautiful the way that he describes it so i just i really really loved that part so much. I think one of the last quotes I'll just leave this clip off with before I come back in probably a couple days and tell you my last thoughts on this book is from chapter 28 of Youth in the Country and it's him getting back to his childhood home and it's just a really beautiful nostalgia filled quote and it says the house joyfully took me in its embrace even as I was and with every floorboard, every window, every step of the stairway, every creak, it awakened in me a host of images, feelings, and events from the happy, irrecoverable past. We came to our old bedroom. All the terrors of childhood were still hidden in its dark corners and doorways. We passed through it to the drawing room. The same quiet, tender mother's love suffused everything in it. We crossed the salon. The carefree clamor of childhood gaiety had, it seemed, merely been suspended and was waiting to be brought back to life. Yeah, so I will now finish up this book either today or tomorrow, and then I will be back to tell you my last, last thoughts on this book. So this was quite the long sit down chat and I'm gonna go finish my tea and read some more. Hi guys, so. <laughs> 
I'm here to give you my last and final thoughts on um, Tolstoy. Today is Saturday, February 6th, which means that in about an hour and 19 minutes, um, Carolyn and I will be having our first debate for this book club. We tried to get a little bit professional, although I am wearing sweatpants and dick and socks on the bottom. So yeah, anyway. Um, right, so I did finish this. Um, I ended up giving it four stars, although to be honest, there was a lot I was extremely disappointed um, in this book with. I think the first thing was definitely like a lot of missed opportunities with this book and thinking about like, is this a book about privilege and about upper class and about class or is this a privileged and classist book? I do think it's a bit of both because Tolstoy at the time that he was writing this later in his life, he confessed that at the time he didn't believe a lot of what he was trying to talk about in this book uh, or what he calls the democratic tendency. Um, but I do think there are a lot of missed opportunities um, and the way it ends, especially because this book um, was never finished. Tolstoy did not end up writing the fourth movement, which I think was called manhood. Um, he decided not to for various reasons. So. Yeah, I think there were a lot of missed opportunities. It's especially disappointing seeing as the last chapter in youth is called I Fail. Um, and then it ends with Nikolenka writing a new book of rules to live his life and saying that he's never going to slack off, never going to miss any opportunity for moral improvement and such. And so a lot of this book, um, for me and in my opinion, what I didn't like about it was that it was too much focused on Nikolenka's um, battle, moral battle with himself about his place in society rather than focusing on what could be really important uh, momentous change in Russian society in this upper class family at the time. The battle between Nikolenka wanting to close this gap and really coming to realize and to understand um, the separation that separates him and people who are lower class than him. Uh, in the last few chapters in Youth, we see that he does start to um, get in and kind of infiltrate this close-knit group of friends who are lower born than him. And although he is so contemptuous and um, says really awful, horrible, horrible things about them, he does see how close they all are and how smart they all are. Um, but I don't think that connection is ever fully made and it's extremely disappointing. Um, it's also extremely unenjoyable to read, like I said about the superior being um, for basically the whole book. He never really comes to terms. He never fully understands his place, his actions. Um, and yeah, so in the end, I think there were a lot of really missed opportunities for me. That's why this book didn't really have, I think an effect on me too much other than really enjoying the writing. Um, and Tolstoy's skill at writing. The content of this book, I think I was left at the end thinking, what is the point? What did I get out of this? What did our protagonist get out of this? Not a lot, there is no redemption. I think they missed a lot of the coming of age elements of this novel because I think like we said, this was Tolstoy's one and only attempt to write like Dickens, specifically to write or try to write a book like David Copperfield, which is the essential coming of age story. But I do think this trilogy lacks and has a void where a lot of those coming of age um, ingredients should be for this recipe. So I think that was missed out on as well. Overall, I did enjoy it, but mostly, like I said, for the writing, for the nostalgia, for especially childhood. I think if I read childhood on its own, <laughs> that would have been much better than reading the rest of the trilogy. So um, yes. But of course I have a lot more to say about it. I have about five pages of notes here um, that I have to talk to Carolyn about. So yeah, most of them of course though are <laughs> taking down this book, trying to take down this book. So I just wanted to give kind of a mix of everything in this vlog. And if you'd like to see um, Carolyn arguing for this book and me arguing against it, then the live show will still be up. It was yesterday because I'm gonna try and get this video out today on Sunday. Hi, how are you? I hope you've had a wonderful week, but um, yeah, I'll leave you with one last quote, I think, that I really enjoyed, and then that will be a wrap on the first Dickens versus Tolstoy debate, um, which is so exciting, so I really like this one. Um, it's often less painful to bang your head with full force 
against a lintel than to touch, however gingerly, a raw wound. And there is such a raw wound in almost every family. I don't know. It just reminded me a lot of Anna Karenina as well, I think. This is probably my favorite quote um, in the whole book. And although I was alone, it would still seem to me that the mystery and majesty of nature and the bright, alluring circle of the moon stopped for some reason at a single high, indefinite point in the pale blue sky, yet shining everywhere, as if filling the immensity of space with itself. And I, an insignificant worm soiled by every petty, wretched human passion, yet with all the immense, mighty power of imagination and love. It would still seem to me in those moments that nature and the moon and I were one and the same. So that's what I liked most about this book um, was moments like that. So yes, that is a wrap on Childhood Boyhood Youth. Thank you so much for coming along on this journey. It was a long one. This is probably a mini film. I know Carolyn's was almost two hours. I watched all of it, listened to all of it. Um, so yeah, we'd like to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for embarking on this little um, journey with us, a four year journey. Uh, next month, of course, is Pickwick Papers, which I have over there. Haven't started it yet. So yeah, thank you so much for watching. I hope you had fun at the debate. I'm really, really excited. A little bit nervous, but mostly just excited to see just how it goes and to have like a conversation because Carolyn and I kind of agreed not to talk too much to each other basically at all except for brief broad opinions on the book as a whole so I'm really excited to see what she has to say and um yeah all right I think I'm gonna sign off um thank you so much for watching I'll see you very soon to talk about the Pickwick Papers I'll probably split that one into two vlogs because it's really really long oh my gosh um but yeah, just seriously, thank you so much for all of your support. Um, it's been so nice watching and hearing people's thoughts, opinions, seeing you guys join in. And um, yeah, I just love it. I love this so much. So, all right. Ciao. Ciao, my friends. Hello. I'm recording now. This is... I, I, I'm, I'm trying to upload my um, Dickens vlog tomorrow, or Tolstoy vlog tomorrow. Okay. So like this is gonna go in it probably. Oh my gosh, know. wonderful! How are you feeling, Carolyn? Can I Hi. interview you? Yes, of course. Okay. Please ask me so many questions. Okay, we got eight minutes. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Amazing. I'm ready to win this. Yeah. I'm ready to plummet you and Dickens into the earth. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> kidding, kidding. Am I kidding you? No, probably not. Okay, I just, I just, oh my gosh, I just want to remember our first. I know, I know. I filmed a little bit before. Oh, me too, me too. Um, okay, good. <laughs> so fun. So fun! Yay, it went so we did well. it. It went very well. Everybody was so nice and supportive. We didn't have to be nervous because everybody was just so lovely. Yeah, that was great. That was great. Our voices are dead, but... Yeah. Oh, our voices are dead. Oh, I voted Dickens, right? Emma betrayed me. We are no longer friends. I am never talking to her ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You will never be forgiven. No, it's Aww. okay. Just wait until after after War and Peace. We'll oh see. yeah, it'll change we'll again. But yeah. Okay. I guess I'll close off my vlog here. So if you want to say bye too. Bye vlog. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us. I always say ciao. I always say ciao. Do you want to say okay. ciao? Yes. Okay. Yes. Or should we say prochain? Okay. Yes. Prochain. Prochain. How about we say ciao and prochain? <laughs> ciao prochain. <laughs> okay, no, no, no. Alright, ready? Okay, yeah. One. Ciao! Ciao. <laughs>